You talk about radical openness. You talk about learning radical openness. I guess my question is, what is radical openness and how does one learn it? Did I talk about learning radical openness? <laughs> Are you critiquing yourself? <laughs> yeah, I'm critiquing myself now. I, 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 I'm not so fond of the term learning. Well, let me rephrase the question. <laughs> Hey, hey, Sal, how come we got the brothers on the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. You can put your brothers and uncles and nieces and nephews, your stepfather, stepmother, whoever you want. You see? But this is my pizzeria. American Italians on the wall only. Yeah, that might be fine, Sal, but uh, you, you own this. Rarely do I see any American Italians eating in here. All I see is black folks. So since we spend much money here, we do have some sex. You're looking for trouble. Yeah, I'm a troublemaker. I'm making trouble. You're gonna be a ball breaker. Who's coming in here looking for trouble, huh? Look, well, you wanna get your friend out of here? Well, are you gonna kick me out now? Are you, you gonna kick me out, huh? No, I'm not kicking you out. You're kicking yourself out. What? Look, we want some brothers up on the wall, you know? Yo. Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela, you know? Yo, Michael Jordan. Get him out, wait, wait, wait. right? I'm trying to get him out. Yeah, I paid for this. No, I know you paid for it. Let's go. Yeah, all right, all right. So kick me out. Beat me in the head and go kick me out, right? Come on, let's yeah, go. Okay, bet. Yeah, all right. Let's yeah, go. Go. I paid for my. Look, boycott sound. Go! Right. Yo, boycott sound. I got Yo. your boycott swing. Boycott sound. Yo, my pick. <laughs> what you laughing at? This is Between Us. I'm John Totten. Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm well. You're John. Yeah, yeah. Anton Hart. Hi. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. We've reached the final episode of our fourth season. I'm writing this intro long after I spoke to today's guest. The country looks a lot different than it did last autumn. And yet, a lot of our problems are the same problems. In our show, we've attempted to just give an overview of how psychotherapy and its practitioners can address what is happening in society and on the news. We've talked about reframing psychoanalytic theory to make space for differing narratives. We've talked about the way in which racial trauma and medical outcomes are intertwined. We've discussed reparations in our country's history. We've discussed the history of our field. How it's easy to lose track of what psychotherapy actually has to offer. And how it's easy to lose track of the patient. And we've heard differing opinions on whether or not psychotherapy can address what is happening on a societal level as opposed to just the individual mind. And to tell you the truth, I actually go back and forth on my role as a societal healer. I didn't really sign up to address society. I often feel ill-equipped. And yet, as our guests this season have mostly made the case, we can't not address it. Several of the interviews you're hearing towards the end of our season are some of the ones I recorded longest ago. I'm sorry to those guests that we've taken so long to put them out, but the reason is that I felt like our last two conversations really are a perfect conclusion to our overview of these issues. When I started these interviews last summer, I knew about the pandemic and I knew about George Floyd, but so much turmoil and divisiveness has happened since that time that I hadn't yet witnessed. When I make the mistake of perusing social media, it seems as though our tribalism and our divisions are too overwhelming to surpass. And no, I don't think both sides are equally in bad faith. But then what do I do with that? How do people change? That's what we're interested in. How do things change? That's what I signed up for, to work towards change. And yet, our main ways of trying to change people in this society, which I believe we consider to be social media, take all the complexity and nuance out of the issues and equate to screaming at each other. And yeah, some issues are worth screaming about. Absolutely. But I also believe that psychotherapy offers something 
different. Our guest today describes how psychoanalysis actually takes the simple and strives to make it more complex. How countercultural. His notion of radical openness is an idealistic goal, but it's something I agree with him on that we as psychotherapists should strive for. Dr. Anton Hart is a psychoanalyst and psychologist in New York where he works with patients in private practice and teaches at the William Allenson White Institute. He also co-produced the film Black Psychoanalysts Speak, which features a discussion and interviews between renowned psychoanalysts of color on the so-called controversy over whether or not issues of culture and diversity belong in the treatment room. He's currently busy working on his book, Beyond Oaths and Codes, Toward a Relational Psychoanalytic Ethics. And he was nice enough to speak to me from New York. How has working through the pandemic affected both your work practically and also how you think about the work. Working through the pandemic has been sustaining, Mm. uh, even as it's been grueling and taxing. It's been sustaining because I feel like I've been doing something meaningful during this time, and I've been able to work during this time in ways that many people aren't able to do because their work is shut down or they have to do it in person. It gives me a sense that I have purpose and I'm getting up in the morning to do something important and meaningful. I I feel grateful for having the job that I have, Uh, but at the same time, it's been hard. And I've lost a couple of family members to the pandemic, uh, extended family members, but that, that, that has been a serious blow. And I have people who are extremely anxious, who I'm working with, and that anxiety is contagious. And so it's all been a crazy, crazy time. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that about your family members. Yeah, thank you. Being in other parts of the country, you see and you read about what how it went down in New York, and it seems like a movie, a scary movie, quite incomprehensible to understand. And so the anxiety is real. The grief is real. And I guess this could also relate to the topic of racial trauma, but have you noticed anything different about doing sessions in this time where it is a shared trauma? We're going through the same thing as our patients, and yet yet I think many of our patients come to us, whether consciously or unconsciously, believing that we have some kind of peace or understanding that they don't have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing the pandemic has done is exposed everyone's irreducible humanity, whether you're a therapist or a patient, analyst Mm -hmm. or an analysand, we're all, in a certain sense, in the same boat. I'm ambivalent about that phrase, in the same boat, or we're all in this together, however, because we do know that different communities have really been affected very differently by the pandemic. And that some are suffering much more than others, particularly across the borders of, of affluence. There are real differences in people's freedom to protect themselves and to get the best health care, to socially distance, mm-hmm. and to get useful information and guidance on how best to protect oneself. Mm-hmm. And we also observe that African-American people specifically, and people of color more broadly, have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic, Mm -hmm. not because of some genetic vulnerability, but because of the conditions of their lives, their their access to good food and clean water, Mm -hmm. uh, their access to health care, their access to space in housing, and, Mm -hmm. and things like that, have conspired against people of color during this pandemic in ways that are really unacceptable and could have Mm -hmm. been mediated by a responsible government, but have not been. Mm -hmm. Speaking of those systemic realities, the fact that marginalized communities do have different health outcomes, they have suffered disproportionately during this pandemic, which is utterly predictable in our society. I guess the bigger question for me is, does psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic psychotherapy have something to say about that? Hmm. 
Yeah, I think psychoanalytic theory and a psychoanalytic sensibility does have something to say. It has lots to say, and I won't pretend to be able to capture it all. But for one, there's the idea that people protect themselves by believing that the other who is different has the bad qualities in them while I have the good qualities in me. So if this group is getting sicker than my group, something about them that's the problem, not about the social structures, the system in which we are both living. Mm -hmm. And so I dissociatively protect myself by operating under the assumption that if somebody's doing worse than I am, it's because of something having to do with their personal qualities or their merit relative to mine, rather than because there's something structurally unfair about the society within which we are all living. That's one form of emotional distancing that people use to protect themselves from feeling as responsible as they otherwise might. What is so defensive about admitting those structural realities? It almost seems as though people's identity is wrapped up in a fantasy of that shining city on a hill, that perfect society. Yeah, I think you're on to something when you say that the, that identity is wrapped up in it. I think it is. The way that I see the world, the way that I uh, construe details of reality are really part of my way of perpetuating my sense of self, my own sense of continuity of being. I organize the world in the ways that are based on the experience that I've had and the ways that I've been taught to interpret that experience. And I hang on to those interpretations and those experiences, even when I'm confronted sometimes with evidence to the contrary information that would force me to expand my perspective. There's anxiety about staying interested and staying curious about information that doesn't fit in with the structures that I already have. The philosopher Gadamer had the idea that we operate from a position of foreknowledge, he called it foreknowledge, pre-knowing. Once we know something, we enter into each new situation, into each new contact with another person, already knowing basically what it's going to be about, what the other is going to be like, what they're going to say, what their position is in relation to mine. We enter with foreknowledge rather than risk entering into a conversation or some other form of contact with a different other person with an open mind, mm. with a willingness to relax our grip on the foreknowledge that we have. And in so doing, we make ourselves, in a sense, impenetrable. You're not going to say anything to me that is going to force me to reconsider something I've already arrived at. I'm going to cling to what I've already arrived at because it gives me a sense of personal safety a sense mm -hmm. of continuity of being. I was the person yesterday that I am today and that I will be tomorrow. There's nothing that's going to come into my world that will force me or provoke me or inspire me to change and see mm -hmm. something differently. And that really is another way of talking about identity. And for knowledge, you can... Anticipate is a way of talking about prejudice. Like foreknowledge is, is pre-knowing, right. pre-judging. And people cling to their prejudices as a way of maintaining safety. It's much safer, in a sense, to know this person is bad, this person is inferior, this person is dangerous, to know that in advance rather than to go in with your eyes wide open and your ears wide open and your heart wide open to encounter a person who might surprise you. As much as people say they like surprises, a universal human quality is that we're very anxious about surprises and we do a lot of stuff in order to avoid being surprised. 
Well, and this seems related to like one of the most basic psychoanalytic principles, the concept of transference, that we interpret n- new information through old lenses. Am I correct in that association? Yeah, I think that it is related to transference, but it but it's not synonymous. Uh, the psychoanalytic concept of transference really does suggest that we do come to each new situation very much informed by past situations, by where we're coming from. But transference in psychoanalysis, I think, leaves room for there being a predisposition that we can notice that we have, but still we might be open to, in the psychoanalytic context, looking at that predisposition. And as you look at it and explore it, being able to open it up and not simply be governed by that which has come before. Mm-hmm. So the the foreknowledge, it, it refers to like a, a series of priors that we're looking to confirm. It seems like we get quite desperate to confirm those priors, and that's when we end up creating a, in our minds an other. Yeah. You know what it all goes back to? It goes back to curiosity. I feel like these days I'm constantly bumping up against foreknowledge, in myself and others. Certainly the political climate in our culture is full of it. I also saw it in my patients throughout the worst of the pandemic. Folks who wouldn't go on a walk outside because they had the foreknowledge that it wasn't safe no matter how distanced they were. In this case, it's easy to connect that foreknowledge with a sense of personal safety. But I also see that foreknowledge in myself. I tend to walk around with a dark existential vision of what we're all heading for in life and as a society. My foreknowledge tells me that the ills of our society, racism, sexism, tribalism, violence, will always be around. It may not sound like a foreknowledge that keeps me safe, but it does. The safety is a safety from the shock that might happen when these things do stick around. It's a strange foreknowledge to have as someone whose business is creating change. I relate this back to what Carlos Padron said in our last episode when he talked about insistence. Similar to insistence, foreknowledge, whether right or wrong, is the rival of change. Hearing Dr. Hart speak again, I would suggest in thinking about this that the mindset we strive for is one of contingency. What if it were different? What if the thing that we expect to happen is not what happens? What if the future is unpredictable? My best work is when I'm able to stay in that contingent space. Back to Anton. People are born curious. Human beings, human babies are born curious. They look out into the world, they listen, they taste, they touch. They want to discover everything. The process of moving from infancy into childhood, into adolescence, into adulthood, that process does involve, in virtually every instance, the narrowing and curtailing of curiosity. Because the baby learns pretty early on that their curiosity is not just a benign entity that leads to all kinds of interesting experiences. The baby starts to learn right from the very beginning in their relationship with their caretakers, usually their parents, that there are aspects of the baby's curiosity which are threatening to the caretaker, that make the caretaker anxious, make the parent anxious. Mm -hmm. And babies are good at sensing anxiety. We're born with the capacity to sense anxiety. It's a contagion, if you will. And... Babies learn when their curiosity makes their caretakers, upon whom their life depends, anxious. And babies learn, essentially, to avert their eyes. We all know the experience of being in, in an elevator in a department store or something, mm-hmm. and there's a baby like in a stroller or something, and the baby just stares, stares at you, like doesn't have that, yet that inhibition 
of looking away the way grown-ups learn to do or even young children learn to do. But that, that's short-lived in most cases of human beings. We learn to avert our eyes and we learn how not to be curious and we learn to restrict our curiosity to certain contexts where it can have a little bit of space, but not free reign. The problem is that curiosity always threatens to bring up something unexpected, something that doesn't fit with our foreknowledge, with what we have previously understood, what you were calling our priors. Curiosity always threatens to to bring up something that is unexpected and therefore rocks our world, threatens how we go forward from here. It might be a small revision of what we thought we were doing and what we thought we were about. It might be a relatively benign and small thing, or it might be something big. Like I thought all these people who looked like this were this way, and now, no, what do I do? That is a threat, I argue, to our continuity of being, to our sense that we're going to be continuous over time as human beings, that our minds will continue to exist rather than be threatened by something that derails us, derails our contact with ourselves, our contact with sanity, our sense of going through life being the same person that we were before. That's a project that every person has. They're engaged in maintaining their own sense of personal continuity, but unfortunately at a cost. And that cost is what we've been discussing, this notion of applying foreknowledge as a protective device for our personal sense of curiosity. If the foreknowledge is deconstructed, then our continuity is deconstructed and therefore what, we we aren't as everlasting as we want ourselves to be or we aren't as safe? Exactly. You say everlasting and, and I connect that with mortality. I think that there are certain psychological discontinuities that feel like a threat to our actually physical survival. The world and the people in it, I think of one way. If I am jolted by a discovery that they're not necessarily that way, I feel not just an intellectual disequilibrium. I feel an actual threat to my continuity of being, to my Mm. survival. Mm -hmm. The psychotherapeutic space is an invitation to curiosity for both people involved. Yes, I agree with that statement. Uh, The psychotherapeutic space, at least the psychoanalytic psychotherapeutic space, and maybe some branches of humanism and existential approaches, less so, I would argue, cognitive and behavioral approaches, actually, which are not necessarily interested in cultivating the broadest range of curiosity possible. Mm -hmm. But in, in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, of which I know most about, the fundamental rule, as it's called, free association, The patient is invited to say anything and everything that comes to mind without evaluating it or censoring it, trying to say whatever comes to mind, which, by the way, is different from the idea of saying what's on your mind. How so? That's a distinction that I often am interested in proselytizing about, is the idea that saying what comes to mind is a really different act from saying what's on your mind. I think patients in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and psychoanalysis probably do some of both. So it's not like I forbid my patients from coming in with something on their mind and saying it and talking about it. But I also do encourage people to try to let go of even that, of saying what's on your mind, because there's some measure of preparation in advance that comes with this notion of saying what's on your mind. And so in a sense, there's foreknowledge involved. I know what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, wow, I find myself saying this, or this is what's occurring to me right now. I don't know why, but I'm going to say it because I've been invited to. And I know that I have somebody listening to me, the therapist or the analyst, who is listening in a peculiar way, not necessarily literally, not making sure that I stay on track or on point, 
not making sure that I work on something. I get upset with uh, analysts who say, yeah, we, we're really working on that. We're doing good work in the therapy session or in the analytic session. And I, I would argue that it's in the essence of a psychoanalytic approach for the work to be letting go of a notion of working mm-hmm. and instead to allow for a certain kind of emergent, unbidden, spontaneous process to occur the saying what comes to mind. And that is a way of cultivating curiosity. That's where curiosity can be rekindled. You're allowed to say anything that comes to mind. Go for it. Let's see what you say. Let's see where that leads and where our thoughts lead then. And it might surprise us or not. That will be interesting to see what happens with what you say, with what comes to mind. And we're both going to be affected by it. And we're both going to be thinking about it and responding to it. That's a subversive act compared to ordinary social ways of being, where we do things like say, hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye. That kind of exchange, I would hold, is a dissociation-based exchange, meaning both participants are agreeing to operate under the terms of the social contract to be implicitly dismissive of all of the potential meanings and all of the potential things that could happen in a given moment. Everything that Anton talks about, in my opinion, comes back to this idea of radical openness. Not just in the therapist being radically open to the patient, but in the words we choose, radically opening the dialogue. The degree to which Anton thinks about the language we use and what it means and its usefulness is microscopic. In my experience, he's not looking to correct us. I take him as wanting to expand our thinking about some of the words we would otherwise not think about. Later in this interview, we'll discuss other phrases such as cultural competency and anti-racism. What's wrong with being anti-racism? I think Anton would say that it's not wrong, but he has a lot of thoughts to how we might modify our language to become something that opens up possibilities in the dialogue, as opposed to something that shuts the book. It's an important thing to reflect on as practitioners, even if our patients come into the office with the most objectionable thoughts. It's our job to open them up to new possibilities. When we shut down the new possibilities, we allow the foreknowledge to become more deeply rooted in our patients and in ourselves. It doesn't serve the purpose of change. I find this line of reflection to be refreshing, even if it is daunting in realizing how much my language is language of cessation and not imagination. Getting back to your question about like what does psychoanalytic theory or a psychoanalytic approach have to offer? Mm -hmm. It's that strange situation that is created by the psychotherapeutic conversation. I think psychotherapy should be strange, not strange in a way that freaks people out or makes them uncomfortable intentionally, but strange in the therapist's disinclination to use the the conventional ways of maintaining calm and continuity of being. And instead, the therapist who's willing to wait and refrain from filling in the silence, even when it is uncomfortable, might make patients uncomfortable. Hopefully, they'll speak up about that. But it also might make them feel invited. Like, oh, this is different. Like, I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I trust this, but this is different. I could say whatever comes to mind and that might be okay and it might be interesting and there might be some surprises in there, some things that I don't already know about that come out of my mouth. Where else do you get a conversation like this in life that is deliberately against the grain that way? Yes, I think it is deliberately against the grain, not in an evangelical way, but in a a, a willingness to take the chance 
to let something different happen from convention. Yeah. You mentioned the different branches, some of which are not as curious as others. I agree that that's fundamentally what I see in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and psychoanalytic theory. Is that historically been the case? Because it seems like, especially in watching Black psychoanalysts speak the documentary, it seems like the case that's being made is that this is not yet the mainstream to be able to be curious about certain areas of life. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. There are some who speak in the film, Black psychoanalysts speak, who don't feel so hopeful about psychoanalysis's capacity to ask subversive, radical, or revolutionary questions. And there is reason for their skepticism. There's a way in which psychoanalysts have been, in some respects, conformists culturally, even as they are engaged in a discipline that is anti-conformist in my view. But things like power and prestige and earning a living and being regarded as as high up on the intellectual pecking order, Mm -hmm. that I think has poisoned some aspects of a psychoanalytic approach. And that in combination with other things like the way psychoanalysis came to this country, the way it was really medicalized, monopolized by psychiatry rather than treated as something that could be come at from multiple disciplines, including psychology, philosophy, social work, or even a lay person, not in a mental health discipline who could study psychoanalysis, as was the case in Europe where psychoanalysis came from. In this country, orthodoxy became magnified in psychoanalytic thought and practice. It's no coincidence that the branch of psychoanalysis that was ascendant in this country in the 40s and 50s and even 60s was ego psychology. This focus on the ego as the aspect of the personality that is dealing with reality, managing things, engaged in the pragmatics of survival, rather than perhaps the more imaginative parts, agencies of the mind. And we know that there are all of these different branches of psychoanalysis in the psychoanalytic family tree, object relations theory, interpersonal theory, now the more currently called relational theory, self-psychology, Lacanian theory, There are all these different branches, so psychoanalysis is not monolithic. But in this country, in its history, it was largely dominated by ego psychology. And the form of practice that went with ego psychology in this country was rather conservative as well. The analyst tried to stay out of it, tried to be abstinent, and to be a blank slate a blank screen onto which the patient's transferences could be projected with a wish that the analyst's own personhood wouldn't be a major factor. The analyst's own unconscious wouldn't be a major factor in the treatment process so that the the operating field would not be contaminated by the particulars that the analyst brought to the situation. Contemporary psychoanalytic theory has rejected the notion of such a sterile context for psychoanalytic process. It seems similar to the fantasy that we were discussing before with the folks who don't want to think about the systemic flaws, the ones who want to think about our society is quite perfect. Yeah, that that connection makes sense to me. As, As I'm sure you're well aware, we see analysts and psychoanalytic psychotherapists who are interested in the ways that we all inevitably co-participate in the therapeutic process, that we can't simply keep ourselves out of it. It's impossible. Everything that we say and everything that we don't say are manifestations of who we are, Mm. both consciously and, most importantly, unconsciously. When I work as an analyst, when I work as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, I partly 
don't know what I'm up to. That's a, a basic, a foundational truth of a psychoanalytic approach is that the analyst or the analytic therapist, him or herself, cannot know what he or she is up to because of unconsciousness. That basic idea upon which every psychoanalyst agrees and every psychoanalytic psychotherapist agrees that we are unconscious to vast areas of our own mental experience, our own emotional experience. We're perhaps more unconscious than conscious. Not that anybody has been able to scientifically determine what proportions there exist of each. Right. But to the extent that we are all unknown to ourselves, we as therapists are susceptible to learning things about ourselves, discovering things about ourselves that we can't see, but our patients can see about us. We don't have a monopoly on self-knowledge and no amount of personal analysis to prepare us to be good therapists or good analysts is going to remove that unconsciousness. That's not going to happen. The point of personal therapy for psychoanalytic psychotherapists is not to eliminate their unconsciousness. It's to make them more accepting of the fact that they are so unconscious and make them more able to be receptive to discovery of themselves, the unconscious aspects of themselves. When you say, when you say personal therapy, you mean the therapist as a patient? Yes, that's what I mean. I'm talking about certainly to become a psychoanalyst, you have to go through your own personal analysis. But I think many, if not most, psychoanalytic psychotherapists pursue their own treatment in one form or another because they understand that, that becoming more emotionally fluent mm -hmm. is crucial. Not, oh, now I understand myself, and so now I'm not blocked by unconscious conflicts. I think that that's an insufficiently thoughtful way of conceiving what we are trying to do when, as therapists, we pursue our own therapy. There are some people who believe that race and, and racism and these issues don't belong in the psychoanalytic conversation. What might you say to that? I do understand that many working from a psychoanalytic orientation have the idea that the consulting room, the psychoanalytic consulting room, should shut the door to the outside world. Like here in the consulting room, I'm sitting in mine right now, we are not focused on the social and the sociological or the political. Instead, we're focused on the mind of the person and what's going on deep inside the person. And in order to do that, we create this protected space where the social domain does not impinge. And so I, I have an appreciation for people who are coming from that perspective. However, I believe that there are certain illusions that that perspective operates under. One of the main illusions is that you can shut out issues of diversity, such as race, such as white supremacy, when you shut the consulting room door. Some people believe that if both therapist and patient are white, then there's nothing to talk about regarding race because you know we're all white around here, so what's the issue? Mm -hmm. If a person takes that position, I think things are worse <laughs> than they think they are. <laughs> because race, racism, structural racism, hierarchy, patriarchy, those things make their way into everything about what we do and say and think. Here's a clip of Anton speaking in the film Black Psychoanalysts Speak. One stereotype about psychoanalysis is that it focuses on you and what's in you and your internal conflicts and holds you responsible for your predicament. One could say, blames you for your predicament. If you're a person who's been oppressed, if you're a person who's been discriminated against, then there's a way in which that may implicitly minimize what's been done to you. Your, your trauma. Here's this white guy gonna tell me that, that I'm struggling right now because, you know, not because I was discriminated against. 
for instance, but because of my internal conflict. In a way, the psychoanalytic notion of depth is an illusion. Depth is a metaphor, right? Like getting deep down inside the person. That's a metaphor, but we forget that it's a metaphor. We, like, we all say that so much when we're working from a psychoanalytic perspective. But the fact of the matter is that the mind is not just inside, but it's also all around us. Our own mind is created by our relationship with each other. In the conversation, we come into our own mindedness, not separately like my mind is in my head and your mind is in yours. Mind is created through our contact with other people. All of the social realities that we live within or under are part of the way we construe the world, part of the ways that we relate to ourselves. And so in that sense, psychoanalysts need to have a sense of breadth, not just depth. We have to widen our viewpoint and understand how being a person, including the unconscious aspects of a person, has to do with things in relationships, in relationships to particular others and in relationships to the cultural context within which we're born. The interpersonal and relational traditions are contextual renditions of psychoanalysis, and they are more readily lend themselves to taking into account this issue of what's in the unconscious. Even as I say that, what's in the unconscious, that's problematic. Like the in is a problem, I would argue. And instead, if we open up to the idea that being a person means being infinitely interconnected with other human beings, there's no way around it, then we need to start being creative and thoughtful about this psychoanalytic, psychotherapeutic conversation and the ways that the betweenness makes us who we are just as much as the withinness does. Another clip from Black psychoanalysts speak. I'm very critical of the multicultural competency movement because I don't think that reaching across cultural or racial boundaries is something to become competent at. I think it's something to become open to. And there's something about the notion of competency which still keeps people who are different from you as other. Like they're, they're this commodity that we have to get better at dealing with. You have a critique of the use of the phrase cultural competency. I know what you're thinking of, yeah. I guess my question is, is radical openness a better way to think about competency? And if so, how does one obtain radical openness? Yeah. One of the areas of my work is around issues of diversity. I have addressed various groups on subjects related to diversity. A a lot of groups that I've been talking to are psychotherapist groups, psychoanalytic institutes, psychoanalytic organizations. Mm -hmm. And I have some roles within the American Psychoanalytic Association related to issues of of race and diversity, not just racial diversity, though, other diversities too, such as sexual orientation, sexual identity, socioeconomic status, physical ability status, age diversities, educational diversities, religious differences. There's a whole slew of things that we could put under the heading of diversity that we need to be thinking about more and more as psychotherapists. In the film, Black Psychoanalysts Speak, I was a little bit on the warpath in relation to (laughs) this notion of multicultural competency. There's a lot of trainings going on in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years for mental health professionals around becoming more culturally competent. Cultural literacy is another way that it's put. I spoke in the film in a way that expressed unhappiness with this notion of multicultural competency for the reason that I don't think that we really should aspire to become competent at relating to other human beings. I think other human beings are are something that we should become more open to rather than competent at. Right. I see the idea of competency as largely defensive when it comes to psychotherapists who are trying to acquire such competency because it's like getting ready 
for this different other person before you're with that different other person. So it's like building up good foreknowledge to return to Mm. that concept in advance as a form of self-protection, protecting one's continuity of being. Mm -hmm. And so instead, I came to propose this notion of radical openness. And radical openness says, what if we could listen to the other, in this case, the patient who is different in some way from us, what if we could listen to them with the idea of being open to everything that they say, including what they say about us, the therapist, including what they say about the therapy, and especially maybe negative things that they might say. What if we could listen to those things with the presumption that there's truth in them, that they're likely to have truth in them, even if they sound foreign to us, even if they sound wrong, even if what the patient says sounds like transference rather than their experience of us? What if we put a hold on the impulse to interpret things through the lens of transference? And instead, we listened for the truth in what the patient is saying. What if we listened that way and took what we heard to heart? What if we took it seriously and reflected on it, not with the agenda of figuring out whether it's projection or reality, but presuming its reality and seeing what that does to us, how that affects us, how it might move us. Hmm. If we could do that in psychotherapy sessions, then we would be open to experience that is not part of our experience, at least not part of our conscious experience. And that would be bound to have a therapeutic effect on the therapist. And if it has a therapeutic effect on the therapist, then it's bound to have, in turn, a therapeutic effect on the patient. I mean, it seems like the openness itself would have a therapeutic effect on the patient. It doesn't require the therapist to say anything. One of my earliest experiences was in community mental health, working with men on probation. And one of the things that I would hear often from them at the end of our sessions was, it was good to see you, and they would often say it was good to be seen. It doesn't require the right interaction or the right words. That's right. I think that being seen is something that many people, I think probably most people, don't regularly experience. And having a session with a therapist who strives to be open, radically open, means that they're striving essentially to see the patient. And patients can feel that. And they feel it and they sense it much more from how the therapist listens than any particular thing that the therapist says. There's a controversy that came up in the field around this notion of recognition. There are some psychoanalytic practitioners who feel that patients who have not been recognized for who they are, who have not been seen, need such recognition. The therapist can make a contribution by expressing such recognition to the patient. Like, I see how when I asked you that question while you were talking, I took you away from what you really wanted to talk about. I was going with my own agenda. So that would be an example of a therapist practicing from this perspective of the importance of recognizing and acknowledging things that the therapist did that might not have felt good for the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I have argued that while recognition can sometimes really feel helpful to the patient and in in fact will be helpful to the patient the most profound recognition that therapists can offer is not in the things that they say acknowledging their errors or mistakes or participation in some kind of enactment in the therapy 
But instead, what registers most profoundly is how the therapist listens and is perhaps changed or moved Mm -hmm. when they're listening in such a radically open manner. We can sense when we've had an impact on another person. Human beings have that potential if they allow themselves to pay attention to it. We can sense when we've affected somebody, when somebody has been moved by what we're saying. And when that happens, that's gold. Without something necessarily having been said. Now, some of the things that are said matter too. The way we say them matters and shows perhaps how we have been moved, how we have been changed by what we have been open to as therapists. My own philosophy is pretty influenced by the work of Martin Buber. It sounds like more of what you are speaking to is the stiffness of the language that might lead to an I-it stance. And what you're proposing is that openness is more about, and this is more Levinas, I guess, but like being open to being changed by the other, more of an I-thou stance. Absolutely. This does overlap with Buber's notion of I-thou rather than I-it. And it certainly is informed by Levinas's notion of turning toward the face of the other and taking the other into one's care. That concept in Levinas is uh, so compelling to me, a notion not just that we are open as in listening with an open mind in a more dispassionate way. Mm -hmm. It's listening in a feelingful, involved, engaged way with a sense of ethical responsibility. Levinas says that we can't look into the face of the other without being called to our ethical responsibility for the other. When we really open ourselves up to the other, we take their being, their concerns into our care. And when we take another's being, another's concerns, another's desires into our care, how can we not be changed by that? We are in those important, rare, sparkling moments. We are changed. I feel like 2020 has been a year I've seen a lot of squirming from white people, including white therapists. A lot of squirming of what do we do? And this is my interpretation of what you're saying, but what needs to happen is to stop and take a breath and to reevaluate our stance more than anything over what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, I, I like what you're saying. I do think that sometimes we deal with our own anxieties by taking action by trying to get busy and do something. And there is that motto of psychoanalysis. Instead of saying, don't just sit there, do something, we say, don't just do something, sit there. (laughs) And we have in mind a notion of the gains that may come from refraining from giving in to the impulse to act, at least at first, while we let the thing that we're confronted with affect us, perhaps move us to return to that language before we act, because we know that taking action, as noble as the action might seem, is likely to be superficial to the extent that it represents a discharge of the anxiety of the awareness of the badness of the thing that we're trying to undo. There's a problem with undoing, isn't there? Like This is one of the reasons I don't like the term anti-racist. Like this is a term that Kendi has put forward and has been embraced by virtually one and all. Being anti is a problem to the extent that it is, in a sense, reflexive. I see this thing as bad. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to undo this thing that is bad. The problem with being anti in that way, with such undoing, is that in the process of trying to undo, we are tethered to the thing that we're trying to undo. We are shackled to it, I sometimes like to say. And we, therefore, cannot think as freely and creatively about the steps we might take when we untether ourselves from the enemy 
and we imagine things more on our own terms and on the terms of possibility and openness that might issue. What I hear you saying is that as soon as we become anti-something, the word that comes to mind for me is to play. We lose our ability to walk around it, to observe it, to go behind it, all kinds of possibilities. Right. Being anti constrains us in ways that may not be so generative as we would hope. I mean, of course, I embrace the project of anti-racism, so I don't want to simply dismiss it. Mm -hmm. or dismiss training in multicultural competency. I, I see people as, in the best sense, as arguing that we need to be thoughtful and prepare for our encounter with people who are different from ourselves so that we can be open to them. Sure. I hear you not being against these practices, but wanting to add to the language of them. Yeah. As, as a person of color, as a person from a marginalized community, what is your experience physical psychological when when something like that enters into the treatment room i would describe myself as racially ambiguous to many i come from a biracial background my mother was of eastern european jewish descent and my father was african american but his complexion was the same as mine he was quite light skinned mm. and in my day-to-day -day life in various circles. I am recognized as African-American and not recognized as white and not. Sometimes people think I'm from Morocco. There are all different responses that people have to me. And so it's not always a given how people understand what my background is and mm -hmm. where I'm coming from. You know, there, are, I guess, are advantages and disadvantages to that in the clinical context. People have some freedom to see me as their white therapist or as their black therapist or as their biracial therapist. And I've had all of the above and more in ongoing psychotherapeutic relationships. My interest is in being as receptive as I can to what patients may have to say about me and also about people like me mm -hmm. or people who are different from them in some other ways. The psychoanalytic psychotherapeutic context is not the place where we're trying to get people to say the right thing. We're not trying to get people to conform to what would be a better socially acceptable belief system. We're trying to help people contact themselves, what they believe, what they feel, and have that be articulated as extensively as possible. It's in the, the expression, the articulation, the formulation of experience that the bigoted, hateful, limiting aspects of a person's belief system tend to be more susceptible to breakdown. And I mean breakdown in the best sense of the word. Mm -hmm. If you ask a person to explain their prejudices and you're really interested in hearing how they arrive at their view and what they would add and, 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 and how they describe it and put it into words, you can see prejudices start to break down. I was just watching the Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing for the, like, sixth time a couple of weeks ago. And there's a great scene in that that captures this where Mookie, played by Spike Lee, is in Sal's pizza shop talking with John Torturo. Mookie asks the John Torturo character, like, who's your favorite basketball player? Michael Jordan. And who's your favorite singer? I don't remember. Michael Jackson. It was something like that. And so Mookie says, well, those, those are Black people. Like, how, how come you, you're so racist in these other ways? And you can see Torturo struggling with it, the character struggling with it. Like, well, those are those are different black people. They're not really black. Well, they are black, but they're they're not black like those people that I hate. I think that the brilliance that's the, the, in Spike Lee's capturing of that moment is that if we are really prepared to engage in a conversation, in a dialogue, then the rigid categories, the foreknowledge, can start to break down it starts to get deconstructed the ways that things don't hold together so well because they're defensive 
And they're designed not to incorporate life and live in a flexible, spontaneous way. They're designed to fortify. And those rigidities can be cracked through engaging in dialogue. The hermeneutic tradition says we, we should enter into dialogue not trying to see what we can gain, not trying to see what we can learn about the other person, the knowledge that we can acquire, but instead that we should enter into conversations, enter into dialogue with the idea of what we might lose, what we might relinquish, the knowledge, the foreknowledge that we had, that we've been clinging to, that we might give up or loosen our grasp on in order to see what might appear. When we can do that, that's radical openness. And that Mm -hmm. is an opportunity to become a more complicated person who's less organized around rigid defensiveness, self-protection, protection protection of one's own continuity of being. It's pretty common for me to lose the openness of a conversation, and speaking with Anton is a nice reset. It's unfortunately typical for me these days to hear a client say something like, Yeah, I'm really anxious about when I'm going to get the vaccine. And for me to respond, oh, here's this website you should check out to get on the wait list. It's not poorly intended. It's even helpful to the patient. But I miss an opportunity. An opportunity to follow that branch and open it up to say, what kind of anxiety is it? If anxieties had varieties, what kind would this one be? How do you experience it? These questions, when I'm really thinking about it, are way more helpful than solutions. It's nice to have conversations like this one with Anton, because honestly, I'm burned out. And these conversations keep me alive. I'm burned out on staring at a screen, mostly. It's been a helpful stopgap during a traumatic time but as I start to reintroduce patients into my office. There is a vibration in the air that I did not realize how much I missed. That energy and conversations like this one with Anton will hopefully turn me back towards openness. What brought you into this work? And then specifically, what what pulls you towards this idea of radical openness? I, like many, if not most, psychotherapists, was a caretaker from early in my life in relation to my caretakers. And that there's a kind of caretaking precocity that presents itself when the child becomes aware that there are certain things in their parents, their caretakers that need care. Sandor Ferenczi, the Hungarian analyst, wrote a profound paper that addresses this phenomenon where he talks about the wise baby. Hmm. It's in in his paper called The Confusion of Tongues. And he uh, describes the intellectual, emotional precocity of the child who realizes that its parents need care. In my experience, that's the story for virtually every therapist in one way or another. You know, beyond that, I guess my racial ethnic background has determined my engagement in issues of diversity and this matter of being radically open to those who are different from ourselves. Radical openness doesn't just apply to issues of race and diversity. It applies to all of the phenomena that may emerge in the psychotherapeutic process. There are always ways in which we hear things about ourselves as therapists that sound foreign to us and that we are incredulous about. We can't believe it. It must be projection. It must be transference. And in fact, I have argued in some contexts that the concept of transference itself really amounts to a self-protective edifice that psychoanalysts have built so that they can stand to listen to people who seem to be misrecognizing them, so that they can stand to to keep listening anyway, even though they might feel like correcting the patient and saying, no, I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. No, I do care about you. No, I'm not bored by you. Or all of the different things that therapists might have a hard time hearing 
from their patients and let alone owning up to. And I want to encourage us to, to listen in a way that sets the concept of transference aside and lets things sink in without employing a concept that what we're hearing came from someplace else. Mm -hmm. And instead to listen as if what we're hearing is coming from the here and now, from the actual relationship between patient and therapist. And that comes from my own many, many years of experience as a patient. You know, I've had some fantastic analysts who have been prepared to hear things about themselves that they hadn't heard before and <laughs> been willing to entertain them. And I've had other therapists who, were, while helpful in some ways, couldn't bear certain things, couldn't stand to consider them long enough to really allow themselves to be affected by them. It's as if they were too anxious to consider mm -hmm. certain ideas that they may have been too invested in their own sense of personal goodness. This is something that I see across our field, actually, is that many therapists are trying to do this work to help people, and they want to be good, and they can't bear to hear things from patients that suggest otherwise. Is that a possible reason that white therapists are so reticent to discuss matters of race and racism? That's an interesting idea. I think that in at least some cases, it's true. I don't want to make a generalization about every white therapist, but I have had many experiences in group discussions with therapists, mixed racial groups or all white therapists, where people say, I'm not racist. I'm not prejudiced. I love this black patient who was telling me that they thought I was racist and that I could never understand them. I do understand them, even though they can't accept that I do. Radical openness would say, well, maybe hear them out. Yeah, hear them out, but not just hear them out. Sit with what you hear rather than give in to the reflex to establish your own sense of personal goodness or reestablish it, your own benignness. That's the, the hardest thing for therapists who are inundated now with all of this emphasis on issues of race and structural racism and white supremacy is, ugh, like everybody's trying to make me into a bad person. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm white, sure, but I, that wasn't something I chose. I'm not a villain. I'm a helper. I'm an ally. Very understandable. I feel for a person who feels besieged in that way. But I also think that sitting and listening quietly, at least at first, and feeling the uncomfortable things that they might feel when considering what they're being accused of or what's being attributed to them, and thinking about ways that it could possibly be true is a better start than trying to defend oneself. Yeah. This idea of betweenness, I wondered in, he in hearing your answer to that question, if there's something about the cultural in-betweenness that puts you in a unique position and pulls you into that work of radical openness. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, I think that you're right. You're onto something there. One thing I know about myself, I don't know if you would resonate with this, but I'm not a good joiner. Like some people are very <laughs> good at being part of this group or this club or going to the concert and being so caught up in the music and cheering along with everybody else. And for my whole life, like I love music. I even love going to some concerts, but I'm, I'm always hesitant to be swept up in a single minded crowd or horde. Mm -hmm. If there's some anxiety that I have about being a member of something, when you are a member of something, you relinquish other aspects of yourself that, are not part of that membership. And we know from the study of groups and organizational life that being part of a group means necessarily relinquishing some of our particulars. And I think being multiracial or multi-ethnic, multicultural, one may have some hesitancy about such relinquishments in a way that a person whose background is more homogeneous might not be as anxious about. What are the things that you're working on right now? I'm writing and trying to finish now, and hopefully we'll finish soon, a book on relational psychoanalytic ethics, 
It's called Beyond Oaths or Codes Toward a Relational Psychoanalytic Ethics, about how to be as ethical as we can possibly be in the psychoanalytic situation, in the psychoanalytic psychotherapeutic situation. Radical openness figures prominently in that. Openness to the ways that we might not be helping in certain instances, ways in which we might be hurting. The best way to mitigate against the damaging impact of mistakes that we make is to be prepared to be open to it, to hear about it, and to promote a context within which the patient can tell us about it. I can't tell you how many therapists there are out there. They they don't want to hear how they're messing up. They don't want to hear how they've hurt. And it's at the expense of their patient's willingness to tell them, to give them the information that they really could use. We know that we can't rely on codes of conduct or laws or oaths to ensure ethical conduct in the psychotherapeutic process. And this book, Beyond Oaths or Codes, is about working in such a way that both the therapist and patient can speak up and particularly the patient, can speak up about things that are going right and, most importantly, about things that aren't going so right and need to be attended to and addressed. I think that the psychoanalytic perspective, the psychoanalytic conversation is unique and it's subversive and it's revolutionary in ways that we talked about earlier. And and the reason I think psychoanalytic theory is so important as a personality theory, as a branch of psychology, is because it's a theory, or rather a set of theories, that aspire to be as complex as necessary, as complex as human beings are. That the theory is not going to cut corners by saying, well, we can't study this on a questionnaire, or we can't operationalize this in a treatment manual. Instead, psychoanalysis says, we got to make this as cumbersome and unwieldy as necessary in order to try to have our best chance of understanding what it is to be a human being in the world and in relation to others. And that's why it's infinitely complex and infinitely rich. Dr. Hart, thanks so much for joining us. It's been my pleasure talking with you. This has been Between Us. Our thanks to Dr. Anton Hart. Between Us is produced by myself and Mason Neely, who also composes our music. Our research assistant is Rose Bergdahl. Find Between Us where you find podcasts and subscribe. And if you like the show, leave a review. We're also on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Mason and I have started posting conversations called Free Associations to our YouTube channel. Find us in one of these places. And until next time, take care.